All right, with that, let's go ahead and get started on lesson number two. Lesson number two, just kind of a review of last week, be a short review. Uh, but last week we introduced the uh, whole concept of living in Babylon, the Living in Babylon series. Last week we acknowledged uh, with plenty of empirical evidence that all is not right in the world. Um, we acknowledged uh, the, uh, the, the trajectory and growth in this whole concept around sexual liberty. We uh, acknowledged uh, social violence, the increase in social violence, and the general overall attacks out on the Christian faith. And there is a sense, we talked about that sense in which people are longing for simpler times, longing for when things weren't quite this crazy. I was reminded last week, and I knew this, I was going to bring this up as well. You know, the days of Andy Griffith were really not all uh, bells and roses either. Uh, in fact, uh, I made a comment more than once to folks that uh, 2020 feels an awful lot like 1968. Uh, it was in 1968, in case you missed it, and I was, I was just a 10-year-old at that time, but could still see these things. Uh, but in case you missed it, 1968 were filled with assassinations. Uh, there were riots. I got to witness those being uh, growing up in a big city. In fact, our school, which was a, a racially mixed school, was actually targeted with one of the riots, not by the kids within the school, but those coming in from the outside. Uh, I can, yeah, and I, so it was very real then. I can remember uh, my best friend, Vito, so he and I going down the hallway thinking we're going to get out this way, and we came upon some group of guys who were pounding on, a, on another kid. <laughs> and of course, you know, given our staunch bravery, we turned tail and ran. <laughs> we got out of there. And in the meantime, too, as we went by, there were palm trees outside the school. They were on fire. Uh, those, those types of things were going on. So no, all was not rosy. Uh, so there was riots. There was the rampant uh, drug culture that was all around us. Of course, it was a high traffic area. Um, it seemed everybody but the school administration knew that the security guards were the dealers. Um, the, uh, so, you know, looking back, all was not rosy. Sin and the... Uh, delving into sin and, and the pushback against everything that is good and right and true, that's been with us forever. You know, it you know, would be kind of fun to have, not fun, it would be interesting to have a study on the nature of Rome uh, during that early church period. We're going to find a lot of similarities, I think. So just to, just to acknowledge that, so in one sense, today is no different. On another sense, though, it does seem the intensity is so much greater. It feels like it, anyway. And in the meantime, let's throw a nice little pandemic in, too. Um, so this brought us to the theme last week of living in Babylon and examining key issues to being a Christian in a land that is increasingly hostile to Christianity. First, we considered what is Babylon? When Scripture is talking about Babylon, what are we talking about? Well, we saw that Babylon uh, exalted mankind. It's alluring, it's deceptive, it's enslaving. In short, the short answer is Babylon is the world. Uh, when we talk about our three enemies, we're talking about um, our own uh, Satan, the world, and our own flesh. Uh, the longer answer is that Babylon is ungodliness driven to opposition of the church. Fueled by Satan, Babylon is manifest in pockets of persecution that escalates in varying degrees politically, militarily, economically, 
through education, entertainment, and a general culture that approves evil as good and good as evil. Well, we also know the future of Babylon, and that future is destruction. We've read the end of the book. We see what's going to happen. Nevertheless, this is where we live. We are living here now. Uh, and so today, we consider then what it means to live as a Christian in Babylon. And by doing so, we're really going to spend a lot of time in Jeremiah 29. So I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to Jeremiah chapter 29. We're going to take a look at the first uh, 13, 14 verses. First 14 verses. So chapter 29, um, <clears throat> now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Jeconiah, the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and uh, Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. So using that, um, using that passage, we're going to go through just a little bit of a background and then talk a bit about the promised land and the exile. So, you know, having once lived in the promised land, uh, the Hebrew people of Jerusalem, they were taken captive. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar came in and uh, finally took over uh, Jerusalem and Judah, carried off people to the strange land of Babylon. The Babylon, Babylonian Empire at that time pretty much captured much of the Middle East, uh, many of the people were carried off to the city of Babylon, which was about 600 miles east of Jerusalem in what is uh, modern-day Iraq. Uh, so just kind of put it in context, what's, what's Minneapolis? Like five-something? Yeah. So keep going east of Minneapolis. Not that I'm equating Minneapolis to Babylon, granted. Um, but anyway, so you go east from here, 
uh, and that kind of puts it in context. And that was a time of hardship. You're strangers in a strange land. And there the Jewish people of Jerusalem and Judah longed for home, the land of promise. Instead, they were exiles. How then were they to live? Should they resist? Is it time to uh, put on a little revolution? Is it time to push back, try to escape? What's, how should they do this? And so it was under this scenario that God spoke to the people through Jeremiah. Uh, and so we're going to again use that as answering some of these questions. A little bit about the promised land. Remember that what got, what got into the promised land, if you remember God's promise to Abraham, uh, in fact, uh, Genesis chapter 12, uh, that's summarized there in verse 7, where uh, God promised Abraham that this land would be his and his descendants. And then later on, the whole business with uh, Joseph and his brothers that brought them to Egypt. They fell into slavery. Uh, you remember that part. They fell into uh, uh, slavery. Then they were delivered. There were the ten plagues. And then, then there was that the last plague, the death of the firstborn, uh, blood from the unblemished lamb covering the doorposts uh, and, cause, and part of the uh, Passover. Remember, it was through the blood of the lamb that God's curse passed over his people. And, and this is a reminder, too, that that blood of the unblemished lamb, that lamb that foreshadowed Christ and that deliverance. They left Egypt on the way to the promised land, uh, knocking on the door of the promised land. They sent out uh, spies. You remember that one, the 12 spies? They went out, and they all came back with the same account. Yes, it's a wonderful land. It's filled with milk and honey. In fact, here's some fruit. It's really, really good. They all agreed that there were giants in the land. You know, you remember that. And then 10 of them said, said it this way. There were giants in the land. <laughs> They're going to kill us. And two of them were, there are giants in the land. Oh, man, we're going to see God's power. Yeah, well, what happened from there is uh, the 10 prevailed. The people chickened out. Uh, their faith was not there. Led to 40 years in the wilderness. And still the promised land was there. Finally, under Joshua, God's people entered and conquered and settled into the promised land, a land bequeathed by God for his people. And the people lived happily ever after. From there, we know that's not true. Um, so after Joshua and the generation of Hebrews passed away, we come to what I often refer to as the saddest verse in the Bible. And this is a reminder for us as we train up our young people. But the saddest verse in the Bible, Judges 2, verse 10, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. In other words, they were not taught what all took place. They served other gods. And then what followed came a series of judges, uh, then a series of kings, and, you know, the constant cycle of good kings and evil kings. You know, it's every, every new chapter introduced a king, and this king did evil in the sight of the Lord, or this king did good in sight of the Lord. You know, just kind of this, this little roller coaster. And so that pattern followed until we come to Second Chronicles 36. I'm going to read verses 14 through 16. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed more and more, according to all the abominations of the nations, and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. 
Now enter Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. Um, he conquered Judah, carried her away captive, and life began as exiles, exiled from the promised land. And the first question is, how could this be? How could this possibly be? This was the promised land we're talking about, and the children of Abraham. And now we go back to Jeremiah chapter 24. In verse 4, this is how it, how it could be. Verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from, the Jerus from Jerusalem to Babylon. That's the short answer. That's why the people were carried away. That's why the people were or exiled from the land of promise. It was the Lord who caused that to happen. So again, verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts. This message is from the Lord. God caused them to be carried away captive. Did not God say in Deuteronomy 28 that if you're not careful to observe the words of this law, did he not say that you're going to get carried away? If this, then this. Um, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. Joshua echoed the same warning in Joshua 23.15. Therefore, it shall come to pass that as all of the good things have come upon you, which the Lord your God has promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things until he has destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. And so the people were exiled from the promised land. And, they re and there was a longing again for that return to the promised land, the land that would be theirs forever. But this is what was missed in all of this. The promised land, that land of Israel, that, that area right there, the promised land itself was not forever. The land in which they were living was not their eternal home. It, was, it pointed ahead to the eternal home. It prefigured the eternal home. There's a lesson in this. The longing was thus misplaced. The real hope, the real longing that we're going to talk about later on when we get to the end of the end of the text that we're working with, the real hope should be on paradise restored. There was the garden, and then there is the garden restored. While it's easy for us to look at the Israelites as a bunch of idiots, turn away and chase after other gods and ruin a good thing, we're no different. In fact, that truly is a picture of us. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, lived in paradise. There was no sin. They were perfect fellowship with God. And then came sin. There's some striking similarities. If you disobey, then you are banished. Obey and live, disobey and die. That was what God said. Um, so then came the fall. Through Adam's disobedience, they were exiled from paradise. They were given the boot. They were kicked out. Having been born with the sin of our first parents, we are then inheriting that, we are likewise exiled from paradise. The exile out of paradise was caused by sin. The exile out of Jerusalem to Babylon was caused by sin. The only thing unique about the Babylonian experience for God's people is that it's not unique. So whether it's ancient Babylon, modern-day China, or even the United States of America, the covenant people of God, are living as exiles away from our original home.
regardless of where we live on this earth, those of us who profess the name of Christ are exiles longing for our real home. But what do we do in the meantime? Okay, we got that, we know that, and here we are. So what do we do? And that's really going to be the focus of what we're going to talk about this morning. Life in Babylon. So let's read again verses 5 through 9. So starting at verse 5, and these were the instructions, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. All right, so we're going to take a look at, uh, I think we've got four things to talk about in this area. Uh, the first of which is the cultural mandate, verses 5 and 6. There are several names given this, cultural mandate, uh, the dominion covenant. But this refers to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 28, where God is telling uh, Adam, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. That is our task. We were created for this, and this is what we're to do. Fill the earth and subdue it. Um, so the Jewish exiles there living in Babylon were told to live normal lives. And first thing that they're told is, first is to build houses and plant gardens. What in the world can this be talking about? Build houses and plant gardens. Um, with a sense of semi-permanency, Look, guys, this is where you live. And, and while you're living here, I want you to build houses and establish yourselves as members of the community. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Yep. Scott pointed out the, the, uh, the exact thing. Work. Uh, while transplanted to Babylon as captives, they were nevertheless to become citizens. And as citizens, they were to work there. Scott uh, nailed it. They were to work there. By planting gardens and eating the fruit thereof, really what they're talking about here is, yeah, besides implant yourself in the community, serve as laborers. Did I labor? You know what I mean. Workers. <laughs> Serve as laborers, um, earn wages, goodness gracious, uh, earn wages, start businesses, and contribute to the commerce of the land. You're to be active in this. Might even start a gas company. I don't know. Um, the, uh, and then the second thing that they're told in all of this is to um, marry. Marry and have children. So they are told, take wives, have children, give your daughters in marriage. Uh, have your sons take daughters in marriage. Um, 
They were to carry on. Take a look at, back up here at uh, verse 6. Take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husbands. Why? So that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there, so that they may grow as a covenant people. And so now we notice here that the first two instructions look awfully familiar. And that's going back to Genesis 1.28. Really, the first two instructions are nothing less than the cultural mandate. Before the fall, they were told to... Um, fill the earth and subdue it. That didn't change. After the fall, they were told to fill the earth and subdue it. Uh, of course, sin made it much more difficult because uh, filling the earth, there was pain now in childbearing, child rearing. Uh, there's whole uh, the whole uh, relationship between husband and wife now take on a whole different dimension. Uh, the, uh, the work, you know, how many of you had a perfectly wonderful week at work where there were zero, fr <laughs> okay, there's a little bit of laughing, yeah. How many were dealing with thorns and thistles all week? Yeah. So that is all part of it, but that doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the mandate. Uh, before sin entered the world, Adam and Eve were given the mandate to subdue the earth be fruitful and multiply, and again, that did not change. And as we do these things, and as an aside, I would say, as we do these things, Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount, referring again to Matthew 5, uh, verses 13 six, 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 uh, through 16, that we are salt and light, and he concludes in verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are thus to exercise this cultural mandate in such a way that brings glory to God. We are in the community. We are part of the community. And we are doing these things. But this is what sets us apart. We're doing these things differently. We're doing these things first in obedience, what God requires here in the cultural man mandate, and we're doing these things in such a way that we serve as salt and light, being glory to God with our good works. We are to carry out our work, practice our marriages, and raise up children in such a way as to preserve and enlighten society to the glory of God. So here we've got the first two things that we're told, the first two instructions. And now we come to the third instruction that Jeremiah gives. And that third instruction we find in verse uh, 7. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. And so here is to work for and pray for peace. The area in which we live. Now, as a sign of our times, notice here, that God does not say, uh, go out, tear down statues, burn down buildings, loot stores, and riot in the streets. They were called to pray peace for Babylon. For in that city's peace, God's people would have peace and work toward the preservation and extension of God's covenant people. By praying for and working toward the peace of Babylon, God's people showed themselves to be faithful subjects or citizens of the conqueror. And of course, in this case, the people, God's people, 
was rewarded for this. For it was King Cyrus who asked in Ezra 6.10 that priests in this newly rebuilt temple in Jerusalem would pray for the king and his family, that he authorized the reconstruction of the temple. So now translate that to today. We are likewise called upon to pray for and work toward the peace of our nation. I like what uh, Matthew Henry had to say about this. Every passenger is concerned with the safety of the ship. 1 Timothy 2, verse 2. This is a good reference for this. 1 Timothy 2, verse 2. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reference. Now notice here, too, that Timothy's exhortation is focused on prayer. But to what end? To lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And while and notice that Paul's exhortation to Timothy is focused on prayer. Uh, well, I did that one. For it is in living this life that we serve as salt and light. And it's in this context, in the peaceful context, that the gospel is freely put forth and that our Father's name is glorified. It is in seeking this peace that we pray for our leaders and we also submit ourselves to the governing authorities as commanded in Romans chapter 13. We're going to spend more time in a future lesson on Romans 13. But Romans 13 makes it very clear. We are to submit to the governing authorities. Now, I'm going to just stop right there and say what we're doing is we're laying the groundwork. There's the foundation. We're building the house because I'm certain that out there there are some questions circling, but what if, but what if, but what if. We start with the what is the general context? What is the commandment? How are we to live? That's going to guide our decisions on the what if. And we'll find out later, yes, there is a time and there is a place not to submit. Um, but, and again, it's not, not always in what we do, but why we do it, how we do it, and who we do it for. And that's what we're going to talk about when we get there later on. Um, well, and talk about submitting to authorities, and here's a bonus. This, this is truly a bonus for us because we live in the United States of America. That is truly a bonus because we are allowed to participate in the governing process. We are given license to participate. And that's a license that our brothers and sisters in China don't have. It's a license that our brothers and sisters in Iran does not have. We have that license. As exiles holding this dual citizenship, if you, uh, 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 we are allowed to participate in the governance of this nation. Therefore, we carry out commerce, we raise up families, and we participate in electing officials. We're even allowed to run for office ourselves, which I encourage. Right, Travis? That's right. Um, and so and if you take a look biblically, this is no different. When you're looking at this whole concept, this is no different than Joseph who ended up as second in command to Pharaoh, only to be used in saving Egypt from starvation. This is no different than Daniel, who was elevated to the office of ruler and chief administrator over Babylon. Now, now just stop for a moment and think about Daniel for a minute, because Daniel is a great example, and we'll use him as an example later on about defying a king's order and the place to defy an order. But keep in mind, 
he was being elevated to the office of chief administrator. He was being, uh, whatever it was, the, the governor, the few guys that were govern, or, uh, governors. You don't get there because of your incompetence. You get there because you're good at it. Daniel was good at it. And that was very apparent. It was very obvious. In fact, so good, it kind of stirred up the uh, jealousy and rebellion of some of his colleagues. Um, Esther became queen. The process to becoming queen was really not a pretty process. Let's be honest about that. But she became queen and was used to save God's people from annihilation. Paul, the apostle Paul, exercised his citizenship in squelching a mob and reinforcing the gospel in Rome. And so to be certain, we are afforded rights in this land that we can and should take advantage of for the good of the nation and by extension, the church. And then that brings us now to the fourth instruction given by Jeremiah. And we'll call it staying true to truth. Staying true to truth. We see in verses 8 and 9, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. So in this fourth instruction, what we find out is ignore the prophets. They prophesy lies in God's name. They were coming out and saying, hey, look, guys, this is only going to be a short time. We're only here for just a little bit, and things are going to be good, and we're going to go back home. Well, Jeremiah 14, verse 14 says, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing in the deceit of their heart. These guys weren't speaking the word of God. They were making stuff up. They were speaking what the people wanted to hear. And now transfer that to today. That hasn't changed. In fact, we find out in uh, 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, these false prophets have not gone away. 1 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Our land is filled with fables. Our land is filled with lies. Uh, is this not a picture, really, of the Christian church today in the United States of America. And we talk about mainstream churches and we look at what's happened over time and the different heresies that have entered into the church and how the church has bent over backwards to accommodate a changing culture. Um, one only has to look at the uh, status, again, of today's sexual liberty and, and see the church yielding herself in an effort to become relevant, the church saying, yeah, you know, it would be good and right to have homosexual pastors. It's good and right to exercise these weddings. That way we bring people into the church and then we share the gospel. Yeah, no. Um, 
Yep. Has not the church in the name of Christ turned aside from the word of God to embrace false teachings today? And has not the church even used a convoluted use of scripture to support these false teachings? I, I heard something this week. Because I haven't looked it up and read it myself, I won't name the name of the university, <laughs> but it was, it was reported that, that the president of a, co a Christian college came out and said, you know, God speaks to us not just by the word of God, but God speaks to us through his providence. And through his providence, he has declared to us the acceptance and emergence of another lifestyle, if you will, the acceptance and emergence of, of, uh, of our LGBTQRST friends. Uh, I mean, and that using this as a basis for saying this is a shift in our thinking and we are now on board with this newfound sexual liberty. So I'll tell you the name of the school after I see it for myself. But that's, that's what was reported to me. Um, and that, again, that just typifies what's happening. Um, the only standard that we are to acknowledge, and that's the point of this fourth instruction that we find in Jeremiah 29. The point is the only standard that we are to acknowledge as truth is the word of God. Anything contrary to God's word is false and is therefore sin. No other way to describe it. So here we are taking a look at these four instructions. Living in Babylon as exiles, we are to keep our eyes on being excellent workers, contributing to the economic health of our society. We are to marry in the Lord and conduct our marriages in such a way that mirrors Christ and the church. We are to raise up godly children, giving them in marriage to believers for the propagation of God's people. We are to pray for our leaders. Yes, and let's make this point. Yes, even those whom, with whom we vehemently disagree especially those folks. Keep in mind, when, uh, uh, when Paul, when Paul, uh, or, or Peter, was, I'm sorry, I, I lost my place, one of those, when they said, pray for your king, remember, pray for your leaders. Who was on the throne when he wrote that? Nero. I'm telling you, it doesn't get any worse than that. And we've had some pretty bad leaders along the way. Well, it doesn't get any worse than Nero. And yet, we're called to pray for them. And so we keep praying for them. We are to humbly submit to governing authorities. We are to pray for and work toward the peace of this nation and we are to do all these things in accordance with the infallible and inerrant word of God. That's how the Jews were to live in Babylon. And that's how we are to live in the United States of America today. But that's not the end of the story. We've got one more part here. that part is our future home. There's, I'm reminded, sorry, I'm reminded of an old Randy Stonehill song. Anybody ever heard of Randy Stonehill? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, my daughter, of course. There's an old Randy Stonehill song. There's one line in there that says, uh, we'd all be pretty depressed if we got to heaven and it was just like here. This is not our home. <laughs> this is not our eternal home. We do have our future home. I'm going to take a look at verses 10 through 14. For thus says the Lord, 
After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you, caused you to be carried away captive. That's our future home. Um, God fixed a time for the end of the exile. Now, for this purposes of this lesson, I'll not dig into it. You know, the use of the number 70 and all of that. But I'll just summarize that use of the word 70 or the term 70. The number of perfection, 7, given to its, uh, uh, what's, what's the word? To its extreme, to its, I'm sorry, completion. Thank you. Yep. So tie those things together and we get 70. Now that may have sounded like a long time for the exiles. Um, uh, but it's still a fixed time. We have a fixed time in this home. We don't know what that number is. We don't know when that's going to be. But we do know it will be at the perfect time. And all things will be completed. Um, well, that time came, uh, did come 70 years later for the Jews in Second Chronicles 36, when God stirred up King Cyrus to send people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. But the real end of the exile is found in verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. God knows the thoughts he has for us. These thoughts are not for evil. These are for peace. Even for the Jews of Jerusalem and the horrifying events that led up to their capture, to be carried away, seeing loved ones killed, uh, taken into areas that, uh, that they shouldn't have gone, even in that, uh, it was driven by God's thoughts of peace. So they did go back, yet this future and a hope was, I'm going to go back here, yet this future and hope was more than a peaceful existence in Jerusalem. It was more than, okay, here's my, my peace and hope for you. You get to go back to Jerusalem after 70 years. It's more than that. Again, it's, it's that type. It's this is what's happening. This is the picture of what's happening. In fact, when they went back to Jerusalem, that peace didn't last. I mean, all you got to do is take a look at uh, 70 A.D. and what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem. Rather, the real peace that's being talked about here is peace with God. That's what all things are working toward. That is what took place with the Babylonian captivity. That's what took place following the events of the garden. That's what took place in context with Abraham. This is not a series of plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, and so forth. This is one story of redemption from beginning all the way in conclusion to the end. Um, Remember that the first reason that God caused the captivity was because of the sins of his people. Yet even in the sins of his people, God's purpose prevails. This and that is the real reason for the exile. God was keeping his covenant of grace while his people were living as sinful covenant breakers. God took them out of 
their promised land so that they would call on him. And this is what we find in verses 12 and 13. Then you will call upon me and go to pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Through the hardship of being conquered, of losing loved ones, of living under a foreign nation, God's covenant people called on him. They searched for him, and they found him. And that would become their future and their hope. The future and hope was not to be found living in Jerusalem. The future and hope would be found later in, and here's where we circle right back, to the unblemished, sacrificial lamb of God that would ultimately bring peace with God. In fact, this was the, uh, this was the pronouncement that we were, in just a few short months, we're going to be uh, hearing the kids standing up here singing or reciting these verses, the pronouncement from Luke 2, 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That's the real peace. Peace was ultimately to be found in Jesus Christ, who would suffer and die on our behalf for his covenant people. Jesus is the one that would satisfy the justice of God with his perfect sacrifice while granting mercy. Christ is the one today who cleanses us and makes us so pure that we can enter into the very throne room of God, enter into his special presence, and commune with our Lord in prayer. It was the Messiah to come that gave them a future and a hope. It was the Christ who came that gives us a future and a hope. The exiles had a sure hope in their return to Jerusalem. We have our sure hope in a return to paradise. And that's the end of the hope, or end of the story, our future hope really comes down to this. And this is what it all points to. And we'll just call it paradise restored. And that's where we get into Revelation. That's where we get into seeing that great city Babylon destroyed. And that's when we see then the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven like a bride or the bridegroom. That's the future hope. That's where we're going. And that's what it means to live here on this earth now while keeping our eyes fixed on what's to come. And now, another really key point in all of this, and when all this takes place, when Christ comes back, and when the, the, the earth is burned up and we have the new heavens and the new earth, we are not going to be alone. And this is a really, really important part. Uh, look at verse 14. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you, and here it comes, from all the nations and from all the places I have driven you. And I will bring you back to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. Notice from all the places. From Revelation 7, verses 9 through 12. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Notice also that ends. To the place from which we were carried away. We were exiled from the garden. And guess where we're going to go? New heavens and new earth. Paradise restored. We are back home. That's where we're going. That's our eternal home. That's what we long for. So we're not all that different from our brothers and sisters in Christ living in China. Brazil, Syria, the Philippines, or anywhere else around the world. We all hold that citizenship in our, in our uh, land, in submission to our government. We live as 
as a member of the community locally, but more importantly, we hold that heavenly citizenship where we look ahead to our final eternal home. That's where we're going. So I can stand here and tell you that, you know, that old phrase, we've read the end of the book, that's where we're going, which makes all of the hardship, thorns, thistles, all the persecution, everything going on here, that ain't nothing compared to where we're going. That's the direction we're taking. While we in the United States of America endure painful politics, insane social issues, and unsustainable economic practices in our earthly country, others endure everything from illegal worship services to beheadings and from an influential godless culture to just plain apathy. Nevertheless, and here he is, just kind of sum it all together, we are called to work toward and pray for the peace of our respective countries. The same message that we went through today is the same message that our brothers and sisters receive no matter what land in which they live. We are all called to pray for our respective country's leaders. We are all called to do commerce in our respective countries. We are all called to propagate our people through marriage in our respective countries. We are all called to ignore false teachers and rely on God's word and faith in our respective countries. And we are all called to look for the future and hope of our heavenly citizenship when God will gather all his people from all over the earth and from throughout time in glorious resurrection into the new heavens and the new earth, into paradise restored, where we will have perfect fellowship with our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So next time, we're going to take that, that general overview of how to live in this land. The next step is we're going to take a look more specifically now uh, the next lesson is going to be on the biblical role of government and our response.